Welcome back to the Tour on the Music podcast. This is episode 29, three weeks in a row. I'm Kyle. And this is a special episode because we have a returning guest who I'm going to introduce first today. So here we go. Your mind. It is the center of your life. It is everything you hear. Everything you see, everything you feel, it is everything you are. So we have Darren back. Darren, welcome, sir. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much. What what a what a a profound introduction. I I, am humbled by that. (laughs) That's amazing. Thank you. I'm doing very well. Thank you. And then we got CJ here. So CJ, what's up? Hey. (laughs) Hey. <laughs> that was uh right. that, yeah like uh darren said that was a very uh where is that from that's the total recall trailer. is it is it is the troller recall, yeah. right yeah. okay yeah. i couldn't remember <laughs> i didn't even catch the reference that that's awesome that's even better, <laughs> <laughs> even better. so I, i'll give i'll give cj one too so you got a lot of nerve showing your face around here that's from Total Recall as well. So. Yeah, that is. That's too funny. <laughs> I heard that during the trail. I went, yeah, that's perfect. We got to add that one in there. Uh, so, gentlemen, how are you tonight? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Good. How about you, CJ? And Kyle, how are you doing? I'm, do- I'm doing all right. I'm just impressed Kyle remembered again how to introduce himself. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> it's starting to get a, a, a habit now, so maybe maybe we'll we'll be okay going forward. I doubt it, but yeah, uh, <laughs> I have to, I have to. How many, how many episodes? To, this is three weeks in a row. I've introduced myself. Yeah, how many how many episodes you have to do it in a row for it to become a habit? Right? It's, I don't know. Twenty seven episodes I, in a I row. Don't know. Like that. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully not. <laughs> the problem is, I've done it what twenty six times without it, and now three times with it. So I don't know. Hopefully it'll catch on. <laughs> um, I don't know. I would like to 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 state that we uh we have exactly nine hundred and ninety one downloads. We're nine yes. shy from a thousand downloads. So you are going to put cool. us over a thousand, sir. Yeah, you will definitely I put us over so. a thousand. Congratulations! That's a great yeah. achievement, and a great accomplishment. Yeah. I've been listening to you guys every week, enjoying it mm-hmm. uh, all the way through. Uh, I have not listened to my own. Um, <laughs> oddly enough, my, my mom has, and my friends have, but uh, I have not because I, I just, felt that I was just listen to it on mute so we get the so we get the listen. So <laughs> that's true, right? Uh, it, it's downloaded, but it, it's not listened to. So uh, or that's yeah, so I'll, I'll make sure that I do. But um, did anyway, you, but yeah, did you last time any... I was here, I was so excited and, and nervous, and I felt like I was talking a million miles an hour. Uh, I probably I probably will still do the same thing here, but I'll try to be a little bit more uh, sedate and a little more under control. So I think it sounded great, <laughs> so I'm not worried. Oh, great. Yeah, what, did you get any feedback from your family and friends that listened to it? <laughs> My mom thought it was fantastic, uh, as, as always, okay. right? M- m- mothers <laughs> love that. But um, yeah, I mean, the, the few who listened to it enjoyed it, and that, that was cool. Good. So yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Um, so what do you guys listen to? Anything, anything out of the ordinary? Anything good? Anything bad? Yeah, I... I uh, I think I might have mentioned when I was last on that uh, I do watch uh, a, a show or a channel uh, called Twitch, and Twitch has all kinds of streams of, of all of all sites and and sizes and types. Um, and so over over the uh, past couple of years that I've been watching Twitch, I've seen gaming uh, streams. I've seen you know, every kind of stream you can possibly think of. But recently, I came across one that is a gentleman in Montreal uh, named Sam. And his channel is Vinyl Junkies. And Sam is a vinyl collector. He has, I think, something like 9,000 uh, records. And when he streams, wow. it's, just him, it's just him sitting at his two, two turntables. And he's got his wall behind him and a, another room sort of elsewhere. Off, you know, the camera, there's a camera there as well. And it's just, it's, it's what I imagine for myself with books he has with records. And it, it's incredible. I mean, he just has them everywhere you could possibly think. Mm. Um, and he'll play anything and everything you can possibly think of. So in listening to that over the past couple of weeks, I've listened to all kinds of cool things. He had some reggae Beatles. He had some um, wow. some metal that I've never even heard of these bands. He had some mm. uh, in, er, very early industrial stuff like Skinny Puppy 
and things of that nature. Uh, he played some 80s, so some like middle of the road 80s that everyone's going to know. Um, really cool stuff. And he seems like a, a pretty cool guy. And uh, so that that was pretty cool. So some, some um, exposure to things that I otherwise would never have listened to. And uh, in that, two albums came to mind. There's a band called Sugar, which I think is a, a subset of, of another band called Husker Du uh, from, I believe, the late mid to late 80s, maybe uh, into the early 90s. And this band is called Sugar. And in hearing it on his channel, um, I was enthralled. I was like, this is really cool sounding. So I downloaded that. I haven't listened to the whole thing aside from that Twitch stream, but so far so good from what I've heard. And then another band nice. that I think I think is pretty recent called Idols, I-D-L-E-S, uh, and their album is called Ultra Mono, uh, M-O-N-O. Um, and that seemed pretty cool as well. So that was new. And then something old I listened to, uh, somehow I got a link to um, an ELO song, Electric Light Orchestra, the, the old... Uh, sort of Beatlesque uh, orchestral kind of thing from the 70s and 80s and got into them and was uh, trimming my hair uh, and playing some ELO the, the other night at like three in the morning, I think it was. I hope the person downstairs didn't didn't mind it too much. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> great stuff. Uh, I, I love ELO and Jeff Lynn. Nice. So that was me. Awesome. CJ, what about you, sir? So um, I, as I was talking to Kyle prior to you getting on, Darren, I was on Twitter and uh, as as we uh, as you know, we've we've met D Schneider a couple times while working yeah. in the mall. So I happen to follow him on Twitter, and I think I think his tweets are fantastic, uh, both for many many reasons, both politically, both musically, you know, all that stuff. But he did send out a tweet uh, the other day that kind of stood out to me, and I thought it was very interesting. So it reads: So how many bands do you listen to? that you can put all their albums on shuffle and never skip a song. So he says in I Had One, ACDC. So basically he could play all his their albums and never skip a song. And he goes, all my other fra- faves have tracks I can live without. Then he states, now I have one more. I'm assuming like a recent find. And the group's, band, the group's name is Monster Truck. They have seven albums. And he goes, not a bad track on them. And then um, hmm. he says something that I can't read out loud because there's a lot of cursing in it. <laughs> so, and and it's really funny. So I thought that was very interesting. And, but what I thought of, I was like, let me go listen to Monster Truck out of curiosity because I'm just curious. So I'm going to play a song from their latest album just for the heck of it. It's called Monster Truck Warriors. And this is the title track. <laughs> Unexpectedly, I like the whole, like, and I just listened to the whole album, and I and I love that um like they have like a um you know, like on Apple Music it says like the name of the album it says the name of the the group and then underneath that it says just out for a rip are ya bud here's your soundtrack and like the whole soundtrack like I've gotten through probably the first when I started listening to like the first four or five songs um and then I for some reason I listened to a podcast uh. <laughs> But it, it was it was actually it was really good. So I I ask you, both of you and whoever wants to answer. I know, Kyle, you have to still share what you've been listening to. But what group could you play all their albums and never skip a song? I, I propose that question. So before the questions answer, it'll give Darren some time to think about it. Kyle, what have you listened to? Like anything interesting? 
Um, I've gone back to uh, Stanley Clark. Oh, okay. uh, Stanley Clark is a is a brilliant bass player. We mentioned him a couple times in the podcast, and he's also a composer. He's done soundtracks for or scores for for movies and stuff. Um, and I, I, he's just got he has so many albums out. So he is not going to be on the list because he's got like twenty something albums. <laughs> Um, and it's hard to, I mean, his stuff is all great, but I don't know that I could do every single album without skipping one. Um, partially because there are some that I like so much that I would go back to them and skip other ones. Um, but one of the albums that he he um, he came out with recently, it was 2018, I think, an album called Up. Uh, this is called Pop Virgil. <laughs> So he played with a group called Return to Forever, which was big uh, back in the 70s and 80s. Played with Chick Corea and Al Di Miola. And Chick Corea wrote a song called No Mystery, which is by far my favorite Return to Forever song. And then Stanley covered it on his album called uh, The Stanley Clark Band, which featured uh, Ronald Brunner Jr. on the drums and Hiromi on the piano. And it sounds like this. So it's very fusion jazz. It's it's great stuff, um, but that's what I've been listening to a lot of Stanley Clark the last couple of days. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Now, can you answer that question? Or should we go to Darren first? Let's go to Darren first. Darren, what what if he's group? got an answer? If not, you got an answer. Try. It's I thought it would be hard, but it's actually easier than I thought. It. I have to go very standard, very very, tip, very typical for a lot of people, but it's got to be the Beatles. Um, for me, they, they are the foundation to so much of what I love, uh, to almost everything that I love musically. So, um, and I was thinking about the few songs that I don't love necessarily, but even there, I've listened to like the White Album. There's a couple of tracks in the White Album that I don't love as much, like Revolution 9, although it's, it's an interesting piece of art. I don't know that I would want to listen to it for enjoyment necessarily all the time, but um, but I wouldn't skip it, you know, and I have not skipped it when I listen to the White Album, for example. So just, just, just as one example. So I think they're the only band that I can think of that I would definitive, definitively not skip anything. Uh, Daryl Hall and John Oates might be close. I know that they were sort of my Beatles growing up in, in a sense, or my second Beatles, I guess. Um, there aren't too many tracks by them that I don't like, so that would be, be close. So those would be the two that come, come to my mind. That's interesting. Kyle, that must make your heart sing because Beatles being one of your favorite groups to hear <laughs> <Absolutely>. that. <laughs> Absolutely. Did you did um, anything come up for you? Yeah, I'm I'm just I'm going through my, my music just to make sure I I don't miss anyone. I think I've got three of them. And some of them might be a little bit cheating, but Well, I mean that's what you do because last week we were supposed to do something. You still yeah, didn't follow up. the rules. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm gonna go. So Victor Wooten for sure is on the list. I can't think of a song that I wouldn't listen to. Uh, Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tones would be number two, so they're kind of related. Um, and then Ethan Mikesell, who is my buddy, uh, who's a fabulous guitar player living in New York. Um, his albums are shorter, you know, seven or eight tracks a piece, 
And he's only got three of them, so it's a little bit easier of a catalog. But all of his stuff is great, and I, I listen to it all the time. That's cool. So, I that's think cool. it's a fantastic question, and I think we need to add it to our uh, I, list of questions. I like that question, too. Yeah, yeah let's, let's definitely add it. To. And now you get to answer the question. You I'm said, not going to so. answer because I don't have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, so I, now you're cheating. No, no, I, 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 you know, I was, I've been thinking about it, and, and ironically, I, I agree with Darren. Once I got into the Beatles, because it was like in my face growing up, because everybody in my family listened to it. It wasn't until later on when I was like, I went through school, and I took the opportunity to listen to them on my own, mm-hmm. that I caught myself that I could listen to every album and not get, skip a song. And I totally agree with what you say. There's a few in there that you're kind of like, all right, but you're not going to skip it. And then I probably would place Victor Wooten just underneath them. Cause the same thing, like I would not skip one of his songs. Yeah. And I know we've spoken about that in the past, but yeah. So I kind of agree with both of you actually. So I'm kind of right there. I, I don't know cool. if any other group I, I may, but I, I just, I can't think of it off the top of my head. Yeah, I had to run through my group and and it's it's hard because so many of the groups that I listen to, you know, Tower of Power has been around since 68, like it's a lot of albums. 60 years of music. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's a lot of albums. Elton John the same way. I mean, and and he's had some bombs like that song about the rotten peaches and <laughs> you know. So yeah, it's it's hard. I I I think I'm going to stand by my decision, I think. That's that's great. All right, so let's move on to our holiday with Darren. So Darren, take us through some of your stuff because you sent me a huge list and I don't know most of it. So I am excited to hear some of the stuff. Yeah. Well, uh, first off, thanks very much for giving me the chance to come back. I really had a great time the first first time around. Uh, and this is a topic that um, at first I was a little bit stumped. I was like, I don't even know what, what I would say. But as I thought about it more and more, um, some some albums that have become important to me either through my family or through friends or just through my own you know musical appreciation kind of came to came to me um so that's the list that i've made um it is i kind of broke it down into starting with family so um there are four albums that whenever i think of uh, christmas and i go to my parents house uh and when i was growing up you know to, to this day go to my parents house or when i was growing up uh, these were four of the albums that were, uh, I guess, they had had when they were first married. Uh, a lot of these were from the 60s. Uh, there's one that's actually from the 50s, uh, the late 50s. Um, and it's starting with 1963's uh, Merry Christmas is the name of the album. And it's by a group that I, I know nothing about or next to nothing about. And the group is called the New Christie Minstrels, C-H-R-I-S-T-Y. Um, and they are sort of a musical ensemble, it seems like, and I think they still exist to this day. Um, and this was a 1963 album that has just a number of different, um, you know, traditional and uh, both hymns and and uh, more more you know secular kind of music. Um, but all um, and there are some some tracks that I had never heard of, uh, you know, since from other groups or other artists, uh, such as uh, Beautiful City and sing along with Santa um, and Parson Brown. Now, I don't know if these are compositions that are made for that album or if these are other songs that just mm. others haven't covered, but that, that are done by others. They also had a version of Tell It on the Mountain. So the, the, those those four songs come to, to come to mind whenever I go to my parents' house. They have that that the vinyl on uh, on the turntable. So that's, that's the first one that came to mind. Um, if you were to pick one of them off the yeah. album, which one would you pick to play? Uh, let's go with... Um, Let's go with Beautiful City. Okay. Yeah. Let's listen to Beautiful City. I seem to remember hearing that song at some point in my career. I don't know 
whether I've played it or but yeah. it sounds familiar. That song or that version of that song? That song. That song. I've right. never heard okay. that version. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it sounds like something that might be sung in church potentially or something. Along Absolutely. Those lines. Yeah, so. I'm pretty sure I've played it on an organ at some point. Mm -hmm. They yeah, they worked cool. with Alan Sherman on a live version of the, a live album back in 1964. Alan Sherman being hello mother hello fada oh. <laughs> he's all those like really? comedic okay. albums from the past so i that, that's very int i just happened to bring up that's very interesting that's very cool though very cool yeah sorry yeah, yeah, yeah. i just thought yeah, that was interesting it, 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 not at all no that's great that, that's a band i know or a group that i know nothing about so anything that i can learn is, is is awesome um then we move on to someone that i think we've all heard of uh, and i know i knew a little bit more about and that was the Everly Brothers, mm. uh, Don and Phil Everly. And uh, this was Christmas with the Everly Brothers and the Boys Town Choir uh, a year before the other one, so 1962 in this case. And one song that I thought was so beautiful. I, I love their vocal styles, and there's a, a lot of great things they've done over the years. The Beatles were inspired by them, and so many other um, pop you know, bands have an Everly Brothers sort of um, influence with the vocal harmonizing and all that sort of thing. Um, so the one that I thought of was uh, Adeste Fidelis, which is Oh Come All You Faithful. Um, it's a really beautiful rendition of that song. Let's take a quick listen. I love that uh, the sound of those, those early sort of, I guess, the arrangements and just the the the, mm. the, the ambiance of, of the recording. Of yeah, the and the way they use the choir is very neat because it's I, like I, when I first listened to it, I I didn't hear the choir because I just wasn't focused there, and I thought it was the organ, and I went, "Oh, that's not the organ. Mm -hmm. That's it's voices." Yeah, yeah, very cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, then we move to someone that uh, I think everyone's heard at least one of these songs. And this is the Andy Williams Christmas album, also also 1963, uh, by Andy Williams, the aforementioned. Um, and there's a number of songs that are on there that, that I find very uh, upbeat and very, very just very joyful and very uh, very um, much put me in, in the spirit of of the time, uh, including the very popular "It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year." I think when most people think of that song, they're they're thinking of the Andy Williams version, mm, I believe. Yeah. Um, but other ones that are on there. Um, there's it's the holiday season i think it's called happy holiday slash mm -hmm. the holiday season that's a yep. cool one and then another one um i think it's based on the 12 days of christmas it's called a song and a christmas tree which is mm -hmm. a nice little uh, upbeat uh, a light version uh, of that very nice and I, I love his voice as well yeah i actually sang with andy williams back in let's see that was probably 1965 2004? <laughs> yeah 1865 <laughs> right around the time cj was born very cool. well, i'm sorry yeah. it was 2001 i'm sorry that is very yeah, cool he came to westbury music fair and i was working with a choir director who was uh they was asked to provide a choir for him and they had no tenors and went hey come sing tenor and i went okay mm -hmm. so i did that is so, very cool yeah very nice and then um, I guess the the, the piece de resistance, the, 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 the highest masterpiece of, of these four that, that I've selected from my family's collection is actually the oldest of the bunch. It's 1958. Uh, the album is called Merry Christmas. Mm -hmm. It's Johnny Mathis. And his voice is so beautiful. I, I know you guys covered yeah. um, Nat King Cole in a, mm. a couple of episodes ago. And I love his, his voice. And my grandparents always spoke about Nat King Cole and Johnny Mathis as like a two- Yes. You know, big voices uh -huh. uh, of that time frame. Um, and for me, I, I never listened to Nathan Hill very much. I, I know a few of his tracks, but I, I listened to this album in and out 
up and down and i love his version of oh oh holy night um first off i think that song is so so spiritually touching and it really it really touches the heart yeah. um it is it is it's beautiful and and longing and it's just everything it's, it's it's worshipful and all that kind of good stuff but uh, his version of it particularly struck my heart um so that that's one i, I would love to hear yeah let's take a listen Holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and air. And the soul felt its worth A thrill of hope The weary world rejoices For yonder breaks A new and glorious morn Beautiful. I, yeah. I, I ha so the comparison or talking about Nack and Cole and Johnny Mathis, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wh when Kyle and I were talking about it, we were talking about the voices and everything like that and why I like Nack and Cole so much. And I think the same could be saying, said for Johnny Mathis. It's just like, this is my voice. There's nothing else to yeah. it. He's not embellishing. Mm -hmm. He's not pushing. Mm -hmm. He's not doing anything. He's yeah. just singing. And, yeah. you know, like as, as amazing as all those other singers were during that time period, it was just a natural thing. And I, and so I could like, I like Johnny Mathis as well. It was something my family yeah. played. And, and so I think that same thing could be said for him. It's just the natural voice just coming out. So, yeah. There's a certain beauty to it. There's a certain gentleness to it. Even yes. though he's got a, a lot of vibrato yeah. and this kind of thing, it, it's got a very controlled. Smooth, gentle kind of way to it. It's very controlled. Mm -hmm. Naturally right. controlled. Uh, Naturally. Something, yeah. yeah and uh, that arrangement there's something about it that makes me it, it just makes you feel like there's something larger than us you know mm -hmm. regardless of your belief whatever it might be um it just seems, seems like there's a, a bit of a spirituality encompassed mm -hmm. in, in that presentation so it yeah. always touched me very deeply i've and i was listening to the, oh, the orchestra part and it's it reminded me of what a lot of really good choral groups do and even when they it's almost like they try to cap their volume. So like even when they're playing at their loudest, their loudest is only 70%. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like they could always go bigger, but they never do. And that kind of gives that mystery to how big can they go almost. Interesting. So, and I think that gives that, that that's that mystery of like, you know, that you were talking about. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a, a very good observation that, that, that's a, that, that speaks to me on some level when I, when I listen yeah. to that, uh, that track and I haven't heard some of these tracks in a long, long time, but, uh, yep. thank and you the orchestra, me. the way they, the way they build up with that, 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 that really helps kind of mm -hmm. fill that. That's, that's it's a trick that we use on the something. organ. Yeah. 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 It's a trick that we use on the organ a lot because a lot of organs don't have volume pedals. So you can only play at one, one volume. So you have to trick people by by like elongating the notes and stretching the tempo to make it sound like you're playing louder, even though you're not. And that's just a technique that they were using to make his voice soar even more. So it's just a really well well written arrangement. Very cool. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, all right, so that was it for my family list. Uh, and then we start going into some some albums that I stumbled across or or you know sort of sought out. Um, mm -hmm. in various ways over the years. So this is closer to my my personal selections. Um, starting with Neil Diamond, the mm -hmm. famous yes. Neil Diamond, uh, yes. who back in 1992 released a Christmas album. I didn't realize he had not done a Christmas album. He seemed like the kind of person that he'd been around since the late 60s or whatever. Uh, I would have thought he would have had something, but he didn't. That's um, so he was because kind of a to it. he's a Jewish 
performer. He is Jewish. That is true. <laughs> and he didn't want he didn't want yeah. to do it because he didn't want to tap into the to the money that way. And and they just hmm. encouraged him to continuously to do it. And he was like, "But I don't want to take people's money for this. Is not my religion." And they're like, "No, no, no, do it, just yeah. do it." So that's awesome. I'm so it glad you a, brought it up. <laughs> Such a cool album. I mean, it, it hit me immediately. It's a whole different kind of style. It, it's not necessarily yes. a, that, that sort of um, portentous sort of spirituality. It's mm-hmm. more it's more fun loving, and uh, as Neil Diamond often is. Um, so it starts off with it. Just it just sets the tone right off the, from the start. Uh, the first track I think is "O Come, O Come, Emmanuel." It is. Yep. Flash, yep. we three kings, and that might yep. be a good place to start it if you have. That. Yeah, I I remember listening to this one when I was in high school. So mm-hmm. I'll take oh, a quick cool. listen. Some captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, ye man you will shall come to thee, O I love that arrangement of that. That is really cool, and so I, I forgot on how that is. It has a bit of a depth to it, certainly. So the, mm-hmm. that lightheartedness that I was talking about wasn't quite. I mean, his his voice, I think, it's a little more poppy, maybe. Yeah, like that. so yeah. It's Different kind of style in that sense, but it does mm-hmm. have a depth to it, certainly. Yeah. Um, he also covered "Morning Has Broken," which is a Cat Stevens song. Uh, mm-hmm. Not a Christmas song at, at all, so that was interesting. And then Happy Xmas, uh, Happy Christmas by John Lennon and Yoko Ono, which is also, um, it's a Christmas song, but it's a different kind of tone of Christmas song. So um, then he had a second one, uh, and then he had a few others. Um, so just bear in mind, Neil went from having none to suddenly having, I think he has like five now, <laughs> four or five, something like that. So that was a good, he, he made up for lost time. Uh, then we go to um, something that I came across in the process of putting up Christmas lights. So I know that a lot of families have the tradition of putting up the tree, putting up the lights and and whatever it might be. But for whatever reason, one year, uh, and my family had the same kind of thing, but one year I kind of took it upon myself to do it myself. Um, I don't know why, I don't know how, but it was just one of those things. It was late at night, you know, I'm a night owl. So it might've been, I might've started at 11 o'clock or something like that. (laughs) And I um, just started stringing up some lights and I think I put some around the tree, whatever. And I, I was like, I've got to put something on to, to do this. So uh, it used to be those other tracks, you know, the, the, uh, the Christy Minstrels and, and uh, Benny Mathis. But I was like, let me find something else that I can put on. So for whatever reason, I went into my, my collection, my, my, my big, you know, CD collection, the big book that you flip over and it's got the little sleeves and everything. Uh, and I picked just ra- more or less randomly. And I came across this album called Shaking the Tree, 16 Golden Greats by Peter Gabriel. Um, it is a career retrospective, basically, uh, up to that point. Uh, came out in 1990, so he had more stuff after that, obviously. But um, and it was great. It was such a great thing to play. This has it's got really no Christmas uh, element to it to speak of, but it just it it spoke to me in that moment. And there's something about mm. his stuff has a, a spirituality. His stuff has a an artistic depth and, and a profoundness, a profundity to it. So uh, it it just fit the moment just just right, and it's now become a bit of a, a tradition. Um, most every year I'll put that on at some point when I'm doing some kind of decorating of, of some sort. So, um, and if you have that, uh, I don't even know I do. what I would, yeah. What would I play from that? Um, I mean, everyone's heard almost everything off that album mm-hmm. at some point, probably, or m- most of it. Uh, one that I think is not as well known is, I think it's called, I have the touch, um, mm-hmm. not Christmassy in any way, not in any way indicative of a huge drug, drug on this hit, but, um, a pretty cool song. How, how cool. about that one? Let's take a listen. I 
I could see it as a soundtrack to like a Christmas movie. Yeah. Yeah, you totally. Know, it, you know, just like. It just has, has a timelessness, I think, to it. It doesn't necessarily feel yeah, like it's I only agree. of this, this era or this time. Obviously, it's got some, some instrumental things that might be of a certain era, but um, mm-hmm. I think it does have a, a bit of timelessness. It's, it's almost like it's his yeah. big ones. <laughs> it's almost like it's his big ones. <laughs> <laughs> you could say that you, could, you know it's almost like it's, you, you could <laughs> yeah because th- uh, there were a lot of big hits on that album that it <laughs> it's uh, yeah but it's it's so oh my god i just cra- uh, there you go puberty once again so uh i but i love the fact that it's not a christmas album and it's become a tradition of yours like yeah. and and I never thought about that when I was picking out songs that made me think Christmas because everything that I chose or a holiday I should say everything that I chose was holiday related, but there are mm-hmm. there are some albums out there or music out there that I would listen to during the holiday. Yes, yeah, so it's very cool that uh, I'm I'm glad you you brought that brought that up. It's very cool to share that concept. Yeah. Like sometimes not, you yeah. find something that that has a spirit or an energy or something that kind of calls to mind like a either it's a positivity or something and it, it, it just fits the seat the spirit and the season right you know so do you find yourself li- ever listening to it when it's not december like during the year oh yeah very much so I, uh, i'm a huge i'm a huge uh, genesis fan that they're in my top three to five i would say so um gotcha, gotcha. whether it's phil collins whether it's peter gabriel or genesis uh, they're, they're nice. always on my short list of, of things that i'm listening to at any given time so absolutely yeah you and my friend peter would get along very well oh very cool not likes the likes Beatles. Genesis, likes the Beatles. Yeah, all right. Yeah, Pretty cool. But, and and um, you know, like, um, I wish we had a clip from my you know Top Gear when they were playing Genesis to annoy Richard Hammond. <laughs> <laughs> what was this? What was this? So they're they're the car show Top Gear from the UK, yeah. which now they now do the mm-hmm. Grand Tour. There was an episode where they were in Africa. I believe. Ironically, the Christmas episode yeah, was, where they go to see oh, the baby right, Jesus. Was, that's right. It's the Christmas episode, and yep. Um, one of the one of the le- the presenters, Jeremy Clarkson, is a huge mu- music person, like a huge music buff. Mm-hmm. And okay. the other guy, one of the other guys that's on there, the, actually two of them, they're all music people. One of them actually has a music background, but one of them like is very. Yeah, he's got a degree in like yeah. Music one of them is kind of like mainstream music, so he doesn't like some mm-hmm. of the older stuff. And for the whole entire episode, he would they would just play Genesis to annoy him, and they play good songs. Like it wasn't that they weren't making <laughs> yeah, fun right, of so Genesis. What they did was, yeah, right, right. One night when they were sleeping, they went into his car and they installed a second radio, and they they put just a Genesis CD and they cranked the volume as loud as it could go. <laughs> and then like the next day, they had to drive through like the border to Iran and Iraq, right. and he couldn't turn the, the the turn the music off. It was just blasting Genesis <laughs> as he's going across the border. <laughs> So, oh, that's great! And I watch it every year at Christmas. Yeah. Oh, I, I have to find that. I, I got to find a clip for that. You don't that's have awesome. to find it. Kyle can send it to you via email. He has it. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I'll, I'll take that gladly. But it, it um, yeah, very cool. Yeah. All right. So, um, and this is one that uh, I just enjoy whenever I hear this. It's mostly on the radio or these days satellite radio. Um, and this is a, a song called Christmas Rapping, uh, but not R A P P, but it's W R A P P I N G by a band called the waitresses uh it's from 1981 i believe um don't know a lot about this band but i know that they are sort of in the post-punk you know late after the late 70s when punk kind of had had peaked um there was this sort of you know some synthesizers came in and some other things like that and there's this power pop like this post-punk power pop sound and they had a really cool sound and this lead singer unfortunately passed I think maybe 15, 20 years ago, something like that. But she had a really cool delivery. Um, they had this other song called I Know What Boys Like, which had this this great attitude and this really cool kind of swagger to it. Uh, and this song has a little bit of that as well. But um, I think everyone's heard this song. It, it's, it's a cool song called Christmas Rapping.
I didn't recognize it at first, but then 15 seconds in, I realized what it was. It takes a while to get started. Well, and, yeah, and they yeah. clip off the beginning when they play it on the radio. Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. why. It took me a moment, too. It was like, why does this sound familiar? But then... Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're right. I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah. It's a good point. Yeah, and you always have to love a song that has a good sax, sax part. Right. Right. Yep. <laughs> right. <laughs> so cool. I yeah. was laughing because um, while, while you were getting your computer situated... Um, we were listening to a song that CJ has never heard before, which I couldn't believe, but Rebecca Black's Friday. Mm-hmm. And her delivery is very similar to Rebecca Black in the song Friday. And it was It was just interesting the way. I don't know, I don't know Friday very, that well, but I, I've heard it a couple times that I'll have to check that yeah, out. It's, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's like a deadpan kind of thing. Yeah, it's very deadpan, almost spoken with kind of a weird accent in there. and mm-hmm. So it just reminded me of Rebecca Black. That is very cool. So, I also hear a little bit of like Blondie in there in, in yes. the song. Yeah, in, yes. in the waitresses. definitely. Um, very New York kind of style, like a, a very mm-hmm. early, late seventies, very early eighties uh, New York kind of uh, punk or post punk kind of sound. Uh, they might not, might have been from New York though. I don't, I don't know if they were, but anyway. I wonder um, if. All right, me, I wonder if your uh, friend Nick will bring this up when we speak to him. Maybe. Hmm. That's song. It'll be interesting. Yeah. He's a punk person, yeah. so I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, he is. Uh, Good, good point. Oh, oh! The I two want, of you I'll, are coming on an episode together, and we're gonna have a yeah. a battle of the brains when it comes to music. I'm, I'm, we're gonna watch the watch the world explode. Yes. Uh, yeah. I'm sure it'll be much much more <laughs> sedate than that. But the, yeah, no, we'll, explode we'll with there. awesomeness. That's what it's gonna yes. be. <laughs> I hope I can live up to that. But thank you. Yeah, you're, that, you already cool. are. Cool. It's not that. That's not a question. It's just the two no. of you together. It, yeah. But the reason why is your knowledge of the music that you listen to versus what he listens to it, it mm-hmm. is ridiculous mm-hmm. and, and directions yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and you're, yeah. you're just both so knowledgeable like the way you pick things out of your brain like it, it's crazy that's what we're saying like it's just going to be a cool explosion of like it could, it could be a mm-hmm. two-parter episode just from the conversation like it could be a full season it could be a full season <laughs> <laughs> wow so, uh, i'm sure this is crossovers also because i think oh yeah punk and power pop yeah. that yeah. i love so much mm-hmm. they, they kind of interchange sometimes you know, yeah, there's, there's some points of, of relation so um but now we're going into pop just straight ahead to pop and very a bit more of a lush kind of presentation and there's a band a swedish band from the late 80s uh, they had a, a hit called The Look. She's got the look, which uh, mm-hmm. I loved very much. And from that moment, I was hooked by this band. And they were on my list of bands that when you asked before, is there a band that you would not skip a track? These guys are pretty close to that, I think. Uh, and the band is called Roxette. Um, it is a pair, Gessel and Marie Fredrickson. Uh, and really cool. I think they were, they were originally um, stars unto themselves in, in Sweden. Um, Pear was with a, 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 a group, a, a band, and I believe Marie was, she might have been a solo uh, star, and they then became Roxette in maybe 86 or thereabouts, and um, had a bunch of hits, and one of them uh, is a song called It Must Have Been Love, which I think was on the Pretty Woman soundtrack, um, and the subtitle of that song is Christmas for the Broken Hearted. Uh, I had no idea at the time that, that was the case. Uh, this is from 1987. Um, and uh, it's a really, really beautiful song. And apparently, uh, EMI Germany asked them to come up with an, a quote unquote intelligent Christmas single. Um, and the lyric was originally, uh, it's a hard Christmas day, but they, uh, for some reason, changed that to it's a hard winter's day. I was much more familiar with the winter's day line than the Christmas day. But the song is called, It Must Have Been Love, uh, Christmas for the Broken Hearted.
I don't remember that song, but yeah, I don't. That you I've don't remember that song, twenty years, and you got mad at me for not knowing no. the other one. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that is more popular it's, than the other song that you were telling me about. Are you sure about that? It, it may not be. <laughs> it might not be. Where where's the that was go to the core go to the uh, the bridge chorus whatever you want to call it oh yeah well yeah I, I know the chorus so okay. that's what yeah. I'm saying it must Fr- be yeah fine. it was definitely yeah. right. more popular <laughs> than other songs fine 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 <laughs> I said they're, they're, they're comparable they're relatively comparable but um, <laughs> but in, in this case uh, <laughs> I hope that I call Rebecca back comparable to that but okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Marie, uh, the, the lead singer there, or the, the main lead singer there, um, passed away a few years ago, uh, and I oh, wow. miss her badly. I love her voice, mm-hmm. and I thought she was an incredible vocal talent. And uh, we, we miss we miss you, Marie. Um, but Pear has carried on with um, Roxette PG, which is his initials. So he's done some other. He's done a new album with that. So uh, hopefully he'll carry on and, and carry the Roxette fl- flame into the future. Nice. Um, Speaking of carrying on a pop flame, uh, we then moved to my second Beatles uh, when I was growing up, and that's Daryl Hall and John Oates. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a 45, a green translucent 45, which was their version of Jingle Bell Rock um, from 1983. Most folks have heard Daryl and John's version of this, um, either Daryl's version or John's version. So side A was Daryl's, side B was John's. Um, I just never knew that there was a video for each one of them. I had only ever seen the one where Daryl has the lead. Uh, there apparently was a second shot video where John takes the lead. Yep. That's kind of mm-hmm. cool. As someone who's followed them very closely for many years, uh, you learn something new every day. I think I just learned that yesterday or day before yesterday. So that was kind of cool. And I found both of them and the links to both of them will be in the show notes. Very cool. Yes. yes. They're very similar. They only d- d- diverge in, I think, the last the last verse possibly. So, so that was kind of cool. That's Jingle Bell Rock back in 83. Uh, do you want to go with that, or you want to move yeah, on? Let's, to the next let's, yeah, let's absolutely play it. All right, sure. Such a great version. It is a good version. It's uh, it's that's Daryl Hall's version, the tall blonde guy. Uh, John mm-hmm. John is the smaller guy with the mustache, and um, yep. pretty cool. Yeah, so I, that that's for some people that's become like the definitive <laughs> version of Jingle Bell Rock, um, which surprises me for, as a, as a Daryl and John fan. That makes it surprise me, but it's like there have been other versions of that that uh, I think Brenda Lee might have done a version. I forgot who the original was, but um, it's from maybe the fifties or the sixties originally. So yeah, I don't know who it was. Yeah. I'm sure we could get that information relatively easily, but um, but then beyond that, the last of my personal list uh, is one that we all know. Uh, no matter whether you know Rebecca or whether you know Roxette <laughs> or, whether, or Aerosmith <laughs> or or, or n- none of the above, you're going to know this song. Um, this was a collection of basically all the luminaries, all the um, top stars, all the British top stars. Um, in the early to mid 80s. Uh, and this group was called Band Aid, uh, mm-hmm. collected by a gentleman named Bob Geldof, who was with a, a band called the Boomtown Rats. Um, he had seen a, um, apparently, a BBC uh, news article or a news um, story about the famine in Ethiopia and then decided to do something about it. And um, he gathered as many of his friends and colleagues as he could got them together and uh, recorded what I think is just one of the most incredible distillations of British pop from this time frame. It's, and there are there are American artists here as well, Cool and the Gang uh, and some others. Um, but uh, just a cool song, Do They Know It's Christmas, uh, with a drum track by Phil Collins, the great Phil Collins, mm. uh, and members of Duran Duran and Standout Ballet and um, Culture Club Boy George. Um, and Sting was there, you know, and many, many others. So, uh, do they know it's Christmas from 1984? It 
one that i remember i don't remember that one myself really interesting okay but yeah, you that's um, what but, what <laughs> but i i live under a rock so, I, I mean, and you got mad at me about that other song <laughs> yes oh awesome. my goodness you need i should point out one thing um <laughs> this is not I, I don't want to compare this to the other christmas songs in the sense that this is a celebratory sure right this is a song talking about do they even know it's Christmas? Right. Do, you know, mm-hmm. their, their lives are so affected by the situation. So I don't want right. to be um, indicating that it's not that sort of thing. It's, it's meant to put you in a different kind of state of mind. But, but it, but it the, became um, synonymous with the holiday time right. because of what it was. Correct. Yeah. It's appropriate for the time frame, but I think it's meant to make you think about maybe something else sure. at that time frame. Um, and just I, one thing that always strikes me about that, every single time that I hear it, I'm struck by the beauty of their individual voices, like the beauty mm-hmm. of George Michael's voice. He has got such a beautiful voice. And Paul Young, the, the guy who starts off, um, all of them. I mean, they, boy, George has a beautiful, beautiful, soulful kind of voice. Uh, so it, it always strikes me that how gorgeous these, these singers' voices are. Uh, mm-hmm. Even Bono, right? Bono goes, uh, yeah. right, thank God it's them yeah. instead of you. And he, he screams it out. Like It's like a, the belting line that everyone is galvanized around you know and the, the song kind of opens up at that point really so so cool i know in, in latter days people are like oh this is so hokey you know having one person go at the microphone then the next person goes at the microphone it's so you know so so cheesy but i, I think it's cool i think it's really really yeah. well done hey listen and of course later on later on was that we are the world yeah and that's what they that's yes. what we did we did that stuff you know that's what they did yeah. back in the day they brought together mm-hmm. musicians and you know tried to do good so yeah and it's a damn good song. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's it to me anyway. So, yeah. all right. That was that. Not to turn back to the other song, but we were talking about Jingle Bell Rock. So, go back to that change of pace for a second. The first recorded version of it was by Bobby Helms. Bobby Helms and his Space Reindeer, whatever it was called. So I'm gonna, I wanna, I wanna. So I found him, and then I found Brenda Lee, who was the next recorded. So just for fun. Just to hear the contrast, this is Bobby Helms' yep. Jingle Bell Rock. Bring it on. Jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle bell rock. Jingle bells swing and jingle bells ring. Snowing and blowing up bushels of fun. Now the jingle hop has begun. Jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle bell rock. Here's Brenda jingle Lee, which is 1964. So that was 1957. This is 1964. So I, I, it sounds like they, they kind of not mi- not copied, but mimicked J- Bobby Helms more than Brenda Lee. But it's just interesting. I think you're right. Yeah, that sure. arrangement is very similar. Yeah, yeah, it's just very interesting. Yeah, the name of the album that it comes off of, the Bobby the Bobby Helms one, which kind of like, it caught my eye. What was it? It was, it was called Bobby, Bob. it's like Captain Santa Claus and his space... <laughs> I was like, sorry. 1957. Bob. Interesting. Yeah. Before Star Trek came out, right? Right. right before before Star, Star Trek came out, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's true. That's pretty cool. Yeah, we just trekked out there. I have to say, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Uh, even as a, a Daryl Hall and John and John Oates fan, I have to say that Bobby Helms version is the definitive version. Oh yeah, uh, for, for you know, absolutely. Yeah, for you to think that Daryl and John's version would be the definitive would make me very very young. <laughs> you have to be someone who, who hasn't heard the, John, the Bobby Helms because that, that's it's it's like it, it's seared in in your mind. Right. You know, there's certain songs where it's like you hear it and it has a definitive structure in your mind like that is the one, and that, that is absolutely the case. It's very very so. true. And then moving on to my last section. Um, I had to bring it all around to, the, again, for me, the foundation of everything musically. Um, had to bring it to the Fab Four, right? Had to bring it to the Beatles. Um, and I did not realize that all four of them had something to say about Christmas. <laughs> I knew two of them did, uh, but I did not know the other two did. So starting with Ringo, um, Ringo Starr, we have an album called I Wanna Be Santa Claus uh, from 1999. And, um, I had never heard it. I had never even heard of it. So, um, and I checked it out and I've heard some of his solo stuff and it sounds very much like, like his, his normal solo stuff. I like his stuff very much. I find his voice very pleasing. Um, you know, I, I know there are those who will say he's probably the least talented of the Beatles as far as musically and so forth, but he still brings something to the table. He still got, he has a persona, he has a presence, he has a, he's an excellent drummer, et cetera, et cetera. And these songs are pretty cool. Uh, starting with the very first one, uh, the very first song on that album is called, uh, Come on, Christmas, Christmas, come on. And I was like, this is actually pretty darn cool. Do you have that, Kyle? I do. That's from the late nineties. I believe so. Nineteen ninety nine is what I. Yeah, what I your think. list says nineteen ninety nine. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah. I was pretty pretty cool. I, I'm always. Yeah. I like uh, hearing Ringo's contributions because they don't always get a lot of um, you know accolades. They don't get a lot of attention necessarily uh, compared to the other three. But um, mm-hmm. he brings something to the table, no question about it. And it, it always seems to, 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 to please me anyway. Yeah, yeah. And then we have. Mr. George Harrison, um, who had an album back in 1974 called Dark Horse. And um, most of his albums didn't do a whole lot um, as far as sales and so forth, or even with, with a critical acclaim. Uh, and this was no exception. But um, somehow I think I saw a video this past year. I did not even know that this song existed. Uh, it's more of a New Year's Eve sing along, more so than a Christmas song. And the song is called Ding Dong Ding Dong, and it uses a, um, a riff or a musical figure that was also used by Paul McCartney later on in the song Let Him In. Uh, someone's knocking at the door, someone's ringing the bell, let him in. Um, you'll, you'll recognize it. You'll also recognize it if you have a doorbell on the front of your uh, house. A one, two. <laughs> Pretty straightforward. Yeah, you know, no, that's awesome. Yeah, a, yeah. Lot, a lot of those things have a, have a very simple kind of approach, um, mm. which I always appreciate uh, appreciated about George. I think critics, uh, especially when, when he was first uh, doing songwriting with the Beatles, 
a lot of folks say this stuff had an obstinate quality, like it just persists and goes on the same thing over and over again. Mm. But I think over time he got a bit of a lighter touch, and um, even though there's repetition, it's still pleasing. So um, yeah. I love George. I think he, he's great. He also passed obviously back in 2000 or 01, so we miss him as well. Mm. Um, very cool. And then we move on to John and Dioko. Um, there's a song that I think most people would know this one as well. Uh, it's called Happy Xmas. I think it's not called Christmas. I think it's called Happy Xmas. War is over. Yep. Most folks know it from from the refrain, war is over. And this mm-hmm. is another one of those that I think is is asking you to kind of think about things a little bit. You know, it's like war, war is over if you want it. Um, and like another year's over. And, and what have you done with your life, so to speak, and this kind of thing. So this, this as always, John has this thing where I think Paul was talking about, he was he's writing a song and it was like a, uh, it's getting better, you know, on the Sgt. Pepper album. Um, it's getting better all the time. He was like sort of going through and trying to figure out what will come next. And John is over there with his guitar. He's like, it can't get much worse, you know? So John would always have that little, that spice, that little sort of bit of negativity or or a bit of um, introspection that Paul wouldn't always necessarily think of on his own. And I think John wouldn't always think of the positive things necessarily in that way mm-hmm. on his own. So they really... I think I wouldn't say needed each other, but they certainly fed off each other, and became greater because of each other. Uh, and right. I think I think all four of them really contributed to that. But um, here's another one of those where it's like it's ostensibly about a, a, a time of celebration and and and, and rejoicing, but uh, some some self reflection as well. Happy Definitely. Xmas. Happy Christmas, Happy Christmas, so this is Christmas, and what have you done? Another year over And you won't just be gone And so this is Christmas I hope you have fun The near and the dear ones The old and the young Are they I love the message of that one, for sure. It really is amazing, right? It, it's yeah. it's it's yeah. very interesting how you know there is a huge message behind that song, but but it's become mm. a holiday song, and it's almost as if it's just played as a holiday song, with not implying what it actually means. Right, no right. It's like okay, yeah, here this. Sure. Is, it's because it was written by who it was written to, written by, and why it was. Ri- just here you go. John Lennon wrote this. It's a holiday song, mm-hmm. and, but but when you listen to it, or if you take the moment to listen to it, there it's so much more than a holiday song. I think he took yeah. the opportunity and said, "I'm going to write this song, give it a holiday feel," but here's my here's here's that opposite side of the positivity like you said so, but it's just very it's song about, about about humanity yeah about, about the human experience right. you know it's yeah. yeah right he was talking about also uh, imagine he was talking yep. um that he said something like um i found that to get your political statement out or to get your, your statement about humanity or about our, our condition you have to kind of put it down with some sugar right so you have to make it sound pretty you have to make it sound accessible and, and be able to approach it um, but you can then get some kind of message in there. Right. And I think both he and I think all four of them, but certainly he and George especially, were very invested in the, the, the nature of the human soul and the human mind and all the things we have to get over and, uh, with each other and how we interact with each other and all these kind of things. So it's pretty cool how it, he encompasses it in a very simple package, you know, right. and it's exactly. become so simple that, as you said, it becomes like a just a typical song like like Mr. Grinch, you know, right, like right. That, but it's not. It, right. It's a whole different kind of it's song. Just, it's a, it's a, you know? Oh, let's put this on the playlist and it's going to play because, you know, that's what it is. No, I, I, it's that's, a whole different thing. it is, it is. And I think he sets the stage. Th- that song, I had not even really thought about this, but in the very beginning, Yoko whispers, uh, I think she says, like, Merry Christmas to her, her son. I forgot mm-hmm. her son's name, but she has a son with a different, um, marriage. 
And then John says, Merry Christmas, Julian, to his son, Julian Lennon. It's very quiet. Right. And it's there's something so touching about that. I think he does it mm -hmm. again in a later album in Double Fantasy. He does a thing where he, he either he or she or maybe both of them whisper. And there's something about that, um, the revelation, I guess, or opening up your spirit to someone else and saying something from your heart and from your soul to open a song that then opens up into some, some other direction. It, it's a beautiful, I, I find it very, very touching. Um, very cool stuff. Yep, absolutely. And then the last song in my list goes a whole other direction. Um, <laughs> we're going to finish up on something a little bit more jo uh, raucous and joyous and jolly as Paul always is. Paul always finds the positivity. He has, he's the heart of the, um, just the, the, the brightness of, of, of the season and the beauty of the season. Some people think this is a song about witchcraft, by the way. Um, and the lyrics <laughs> talk about something like, something like you're studying these, these mystic arts and um, the, the moon is up and the, the time is right and all this kind of thing. Mm. But um, I don't think so. I, 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 don't, I don't get that from, I'm like, well, I think it's kind of funny. <laughs> Uh, this is from 1980. By, by the way, uh, Happy Xmas was 1971. This one is from 1980. Right. I think we all know this one. Um, some love it, some hate it, but uh, I think it's an appropriate way to uh, to finish up the Beatles section and my whole list. And that is Sir Paul McCartney's wonderful Christmas time. <laughs> Spirits up, we're here tonight, and that's enough. Simply having a wonderful Christmas time. Simply having a wonderful Christmas time. The party's on, the feeling's here. That only comes this time of year. Simply Every year, I remember hearing that. Mm -hmm. yep. That song is so pure, Paul. You know, it's. I think mm -hmm. there's something about him. He has completely no. He's a human being. Obviously, he has his own limitations. He has his own. His, I'm sure he has his right. own flaws and faults, as, as we all do. But there seems to be something very, very genuinely. He loves people. He loves life. He loves to, the positivity. He sees the glass half half full. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's genuine. I think it's always been the case with him. You know, some people yeah. might say, oh, it's just an act, whatever. I think he's one of those rare people where it's not an act. I think he just really has a positive way about him. And that, that's just a great thing. And it makes you think yeah. of family and friends and gatherings and all those things that he's talking about. Uh, it's just a wonderful song, uh, I yep. think. It's off of McCartney, too, back in 1980. Very cool. And thank you for having those, those songs queued up so well oh, there, Kyle. No that's, problem. That was awesome. Uh, it's, so you're, you're dancing, does all the work. Way. Yes. And so you were dancing with, with, with the doggy, by the way. That's the song that kind yep. of, it makes you get out of your chair, right? And want to want yep. you out of your chair and dance. It's, not too many Christmas songs have that because we've heard them 8 million times and it's like, okay. <laughs> yep. Paul, Paul McCartney is on, um, on um, Ozzy Osbourne's latest album, Project 9. I did not know He that. does a duet with him. That is cool. I have to check that yeah. out for sure. It's, uh, it's except for a Grammy, I believe. That, yeah, that, yeah. That I, I, I was telling when when it came out, Kyle sent it to me. He's like, "Look what came out," and I listened to it. And it, either Ozzy Osbourne's voice just hasn't gone anywhere, which is very possible. I mean, like even though speaking wise, you're kind of like what, but then when he sings, you know, it's it's clear as not as clear as day, and you know, uh, yep. If not, he has fantastic producers. Because he sounds mm -hmm. absolutely amazing on it, you know. Yeah, he does. And and he's what? He's in his seventies. Yeah, I believe you know? so. Yeah, seventy two. I yeah, think. it's I just up when I, it's crazy when it came out. I think he has one of those voices that is just it's like a natural. I don't know. It's like it's like Nolan Ryan could pitch in you know, ninety plus miles an right. hour when he was in his sixties or something like that. That's and baseball, have right? Physical. <laughs> yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Um, it's just some people have a certain affinity for something that they can do with their body that uh, most people can't. And I think 
because he has it. I've always been struck by that over the years. I haven't really heard much of a degradation in his voice over the years. There's nothing very yeah. pure about his uh, his tonality or something right. very clear about it. Uh, it it's, it's pretty cool. Right, yeah. and his producers are fantastic. I mean, I mean, they know his voice, so don't get me wrong, but just he still has to have something for them to work with. Like if if it's right. if it's not there, it's not there, and they're not going to be able to be like, oh, magically right. make it appear. It's just you can't make something yeah. out of nothing. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I have a question for you with your extensive knowledge and and understanding of decades of music, because you know Kyle apparently doesn't know some of the more popular songs than that other one from Rebecca. <laughs> That's okay. Maybe those things, <laughs> I don't know. Um, every, every week, I'm, he, I'm he, too you guys busy. Are I'm too busy listening to Rebecca Black <laughs> <laughs> and, and Aerosmith Big Ones. So I, I've met <laughs> I've I've mentioned my friend Carmen on the podcast, um, and uh, who happens to be a, a, a listener as well. She brought up a song that I have never heard of, mm-hmm. um, and I don't know if it's just I don't know if it's it's a cultural thing, and that's why we've never heard of it. Um, but mm-hmm. it was sung. Mm-hmm. the The most popular version of it was sung by a. And he's a. I think they say he's a Puerto Rican actor. I think that's what they they put it down. He was twelve years old when he sang the song, okay. and the song's called "Mamacita." And in parentheses, it's "Donde está Santa Claus." I'm gonna play. This, I want to play this song only because I've never heard it before. She shared it with me because she says it's one of her favorite songs, and. I'm just curious if you've ever heard the song before. Like maybe not by the title, but maybe you've heard the song. It's it's kind of it's it's total like I could see this as like it's a total Christmas song. Like it totally fits. So I'm just going to play that song. And it's it's sung by the uh, an artist I I believe this is the original person. I could be wrong, but Hilda Coronel. I might be wrong. No, no, I'm sorry. This is a different version, but the original version was sung by a, a young actor slash singer of the time but this is the song okay mamacita The first time I listened to it, it just brought me back to like what brought me back. Like I'm, I was born back then, but <laughs> brought me back to that, you know, fifties esque, you know, early six, late fifties, early sixties music. And I was like, this is actually really, mm-hmm. this is a good song. It's a fun song. It's a cute it's a cool song. song. It's a cool song. I've never heard it before until she told me about it. And I was just curious, have you ever heard that song before? What is the year? What is the year of that? I, I don't think I have. Um, I don't. I may have, you know heard it in passing someplace but it, it's not in my mind though. it's it was hard for me to find because there's a song out apparently called mamacita which has or there's multiple songs called mamacita the original is this the original artist the original artist was augie rios that's the original singer of it or that's the one that do you have the original i'm gonna to see if i can find it because it just came up i've got it up do you so if, is if that you who you have, have yeah, and that's 1958 yeah, yeah play that one because this is uh, this is the actor is talking about mamacita I've totally heard it before. I don't know where I've heard it, but I do know that I've heard it before. It's a fun song. And speaking of, of fun songs. Um, Listen to the following mini phrases and dialogues. Y contesta con si o no. 
Mamacita, ¿dónde está Santa Claus? ¿Dónde está Santa Claus? And the toys that he will leave. Straight No Chaser? Covering the uh, is that them? I was going to ask you for Straight No Chaser. That's Straight No Chaser. That's I was going to guess like Rockapella or something like that. Right, right. right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was going to. Well, well, CJ didn't play it, so it can't be Rockapella. Oh. <laughs> yeah, of okay. Course. I so, got you. I'll, I'll bear that in mind. So this is this is <laughs> off of Wikipedia, and I know this is kind of like loose because we don't, you know, but you know, it translates to where Santa Claus. If you didn't know, um, it's a novelty Christmas song. The original was a twelve-year-old Augie Rios in 1958 which featured the Mark Jeffrey Orchestra. It is written by George Sheck, Rod Parker, and Al Grainer, and it was copyrighted. And I, so, And the copyright is renewed and is owned by Ragtime Music now. And it was... So, it's very interesting. But I've never, I'd never heard it before. I've never heard it on the radio, which I'm kind of shocked with the type of feel the song has. It has not mm-hmm. been done again in a more updated version because it's got a very cool feel to it as well. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I had Latin to share because I was curious. Yeah, Latin too. pop. Like, yeah. I was curious. I, I think it's a fantastic song. I think it's a great song. And I was just, I had to ask you because your knowledge is a little more extensive with, uh, with my, than myself. And, you know, what, what, okay. what is that face, Kyle? Because I can see your face and you're either read <laughs> and don't know how to read. So I, I did a little, little research. Yeah. So, um, and it might be so. This, it's either um, Cheech and Chong. They refer to it in Santa Claus and His Old Lady, one of their little sketches. And it was also in a very Harold and Kumar 3D Christmas. <laughs> That's hysterical. I mean, outside of the common 3D movie. Th- <laughs> <laughs> That's too funny. Wow. I, I I have to say though that outside of oh look, I typed it in. Oh, Caro or Charo? Is it Charo? Or did she say Ch- Ch- Charo, 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 right? Charo. C-H-A-R-R-O. She yeah. did it mm-hmm. in 1999. Los Lobos did it in 2019. Um, okay, there's your, there's your versions. There's, yeah, yeah. Uh, Straight No Chaser. So, but I would expect there would have been possibly more. So, mm-hmm. all right, Kyle, I know what we need to work on. <laughs> you got uh, two weeks to do it. Gonna, <laughs> two gonna, three let's weeks. Let's go. Let's go. Let's Great. go. Mm-hmm. I got to. But if if it's if the copyright, uh, no, that would be an interesting song to cover though, just because. Yeah. yeah. But I, I thank you for letting me indulge. I was I was curious because uh, as I said, as a as a as someone who listens to music that goes decades back like that, I've never heard it. And I and I don't know if it's just culturally related because it's it's a Spanish song, but right. Feliz Navi- Feliz Navidad. I mean, come yeah. on, like that's popular. How right. come? Like so but, that, that um, transcended, yeah. But it, it's it's not as common. I bet you that there are some cultural songs that, yeah. that belong to various groups that that are very popular mm-hmm. in those groups, and you don't hear it necessarily in, in, in mainstream radio or satellite radio or streaming, or whatever. Uh, and we're not even aware of them, so that that, that might be an example of it, right there. Yeah, very. That's very cool. Yeah. Very cool. I always, le- I love learning new stuff, so I appreciate that. Me, so me that too. Like, there. I, 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 <laughs> I know I asked her once before, and then I asked her again, like, we, because we were talking holiday music, and she gave me the song, and it's just like, I kept typing in Mamacita, but I didn't type in Donde Esta Santa Claus, so I kept getting this mm-hmm. like black eyed peas and all these other groups i'm like this this is not the song this is, just, <laughs> this is not the song it's a whole different direction all all different people, direct, yeah. all different. Yep. um <laughs> that's very cool well darren thank you so much thank you very very much thank this you is, both i, I thank it's, you it's for wonderful. taking I, us I, I, on I feel so journey. guilty uh uh thank you I, I appreciate that i feel guilty being like you know the center of attention like what do you like and I, like myself well is so that's important. the whole point right. but that, you know i mean and, it, yeah to be yeah, exposed and, and, to and that's stuff. the cool thing is we've now done four and it's funny because my friend charlotte was saying you're really gonna do eight christmas episodes it's like we've done four so far we've repeated one song or one right. version of a song right. like i mean yes we get there, there's so much out there and that's it's that's the point spread to, uh, so. of possibilities yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. I, and it's, and I, you know you brought up neil diamond which you know will mm-hmm. for the shadows an episode that we're looking into 
in a few weeks um, yep. about performers and and their backgrounds and all that uh, stuff. Cool. So you know, it's awesome that you brought him up, and um, you know, we're going to talk about some Hanukkah songs. We're definitely going to do that. Mm-hmm. There's some fun ones, fun ones out there that Jack Black did, and uh, you know, so but uh, I I appreciate your journey of music. It's not as obscure as Kyle's. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's some obscure <laughs> concerns, but not. It's all cool. Though. It, it was a good. Yeah. It was a good yeah. path. Kyle's took veer to made lefts and never came back from that left hand turn. I love it. <laughs> 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 the, the, the red and sleepy <laughs> stuff. Right, too, right. too cool. And and mine was just a yep. straight timeline. <laughs> you know, because yep. because yeah. I have a little OCD and I had to keep a straight timeline. But um, nice chronology. Yes, yeah. thank you I very like much yeah. though. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, and CJ, for you? Well, it can only go down from here, so get out of my face. <laughs> so uh, is Darren doing the closing? <laughs> well, I was going to. I, I put the closing in the chat, and just like... Uh, he, we I had have the, a question. Why don't you put the closing in the chat for me? Why do you make me go to Google Drive and find it? <laughs> because you have Google Drive, and you should know where it is, whereas Darren is a guest. And he's nice to me. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you so much. He's trying, trying to keep you up on your, your Google yeah, yeah, you Drive got, knowledge you know, so you don't lose it. You know? Don't want to forget. The, you don't want to have I'm happy to do the last closing, minute yeah, problems happen before a big event. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was a yeah, fun day. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I, I was... Good. We're all having a bit of that. I was going to ask Darren if he would... Uh, uh, give, uh, give us the pleasure of reading the closing like you did for his uh, a- original interviewed episode and I know this will not be his last one and he has no choice but to jump back on at some point when we ask him <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I would love you're to a too. perpetual I, guest honest. thank you again yeah. <laughs> I love so, it before, uh, before you read and, do you have um, yeah, yeah. A, a piece you'd like to close out with or should I just pick something mm, that's a great question do I have a, a final piece and it doesn't have to be Christmas related if you don't want and if it is that's yeah good. yeah yeah and you can um, you can I, think I, about it and tell me later that's fine yeah yeah well I, I, one comes to mind because I, I had mentioned sure. um, ELO electric light orchestra uh, at the beginning um, mm-hmm. I just re- really been and I also had spoken about uh, Olivia Newton John the first time I was on and I had forgotten I, I mentioned the song called magic which I, I love that song very much. But I think even more than that song, I love the song that was co-written, or that was written, I believe, by Jeff Lynne of ELO. And that's the song from the movie Xanadu. Uh, it's the title track called Xanadu, which I love so much. Um, the other song by, by, uh, by Olivia called Magic is not written by Jeff Lynne. I had thought it, maybe it was an ELO song. It's not. It's written by a different, a different artist, a different uh, uh, writer. But um, in any case, Xanadu would be a song that I would love to hear. It has nothing to do with, with Christmas at all, but it's, it's a cool song. So. We can do that. But with that, uh, I can read uh, the closing note. Any final uh, thoughts or notes we need to cover? I don't think so. I think we're good. All right. Thank you for listening to Turn On The Music, the podcast. We hope that you join us next week. Follow us on Twitter at Turn On The Music and on Instagram at Turn On The Music Podcast. If you like what you heard, share it with a friend. And if you really want to help us promote the show, head over to Apple Podcasts or the podcast service of your choice and give us a five-star rating. And remember, always share the music.